Today's video is sponsored by Athletic Greens, which is going to quickly give you the nutrition you need every day to fill the nutritional gaps in your diet. AG1 by Athletic Greens is a comprehensive all-in-one greens powder engineered to specifically support your body's nutritional needs across four pillars of health. Gut health, immune support, energy, and recovery. It's packed with 75 vitamins and minerals and whole food sourced ingredients, combining the perfect amount of micronutrients, absorption, and taste to jumpstart your daily routine. You'd be hard pressed to find a more comprehensive powder and supplement on the market. Now, as you guys know, I'm not exactly a fitness YouTuber. You're not coming to me for uh, Peloton recommendations, but I still like to eat right and take care of myself, and AG1 is that comprehensive nutrition supplement that I know is going to account for those holes in my diet. Take a scoop from the tin, put it in the shaker in the morning, shake it up easy, and uh, yeah, it tastes great. Plus, it's gluten-free, dairy-free, paleo, vegan, keto, low allergen, and low calorie, less than one gram of sugar per serving. One of the things I particularly like about it is I have a cup of coffee in the morning. Usually I have my AG1 with it, and I just feel it kind of sustains that coffee energy, which is real nice. If this sounds like the supplement you've been looking for, then you can grab your own immunity bundle, which includes one year of vitamin D plus five individual travel packs for free with your first purchase. Just go to athleticgreens.com slash megaprojects. Again, year supply of vitamin D plus five free travel packs at athleticgreens.com com slash mega projects or click the link below in now today's video. With winter just a few months away, in the late summer of 1941, more than three million Wehrmacht soldiers, along with thousands of aircraft and armored vehicles, stormed across Russia's vast plains towards Leningrad. Outnumbered, outgunned, and reeling from Stalin's pre-war purges that decimated the Army Officers' Corps, it was the USSR's darkest hour. Making huge territorial gains and encountering meager resistance, the Wehrmacht and Luftwaffe were riding high, and by all outward appearances, Operation Barbarossa was destined to be a resounding success. Then, on the horizon, a formation of droning airplanes appears. Flying low, flying fast, in seconds their cannons erupt, sending high-velocity shells tearing through the German armor as columns scatter in disarray. Dramatic stories like this abounded on the Eastern Front. By most accounts, Illusion IL-2 Sturmovics decimated German armor to the tune of thousands of vehicles destroyed. But the question has always remained. Were the Sturmovics the lethal tank busters they were made out to be, or were the statistics inflated and the stories embellished for a little bit of propaganda? Well, let's find out, shall we? Powered by 1,700 horsepower engines and armed with rockets, bombs, and cannons capable of punching hefty holes in all but the heaviest tanks, IL-2s were the Soviet Union's most capable ground attack aircraft of the Second World War, and with more than 36,000 manufacturers, they were the most mass-produced military airplanes in history. Though never officially designated Sturmovig, the generic Russian term for ground attack aircraft, the moniker definitely stuck. Other nicknames include Flying Tank, Hunchback, Tractor, Concrete Bomber, Black Death, and Flying Infantrymen, all of which were earned due to their ability to absorb huge amounts of punishment, unleash lethal firepower, and provide accurate support to troops on the ground, a characteristic often referred to as getting down in the weeds in aviation circles. The concept for a purpose-built mono-wing ground attack aircraft began in the early 1930s, when the Soviet Air Force relied on biplanes that were rapidly becoming obsolete due to their fixed undercarriages, anemic engines, slow speeds, and meager weapons loads. The IL-2 was designed by a team of engineers led by Sergei Ilyushin at the Central Design Bureau, and the final draft was ready by 1938. Originally called the TSKB-55, the new tank killer was a sleek two-seater with a 1,500-pound, 700-kilogram armored bathtub protecting the crew, engine, and fuel tank from ground fire. Ranging from 5 to 12 millimeters thick, the armor was capable of stopping small arms rounds and deflecting shots from large caliber weapons like 20 and 40 millimeter cannons if they impacted at an angle. The other aircraft of the day had armor protection as well, but the IL-2's individual plates replaced standard panels and frame elements, which had the added benefit of increasing airframe strength. 
Decked out for battle, Elysians tipped the scales at about 10,400 pounds, that's 4,700 kilograms, of which the armor accounted for nearly 15% of the total weight. This, of course, limited speed, range, and agility, but was nonetheless an essential element for an aircraft tasked with flying low and relatively slow over enemy formations, equipped with everything from bolt action Mausers to 88mm flak cannons, projectiles from the latter of which could punch through the IL-2's armor like a jackhammer through a hunk of warm Velveeta. In most cases, however, low, lumbering Sturvigs proved difficult targets, though over the course of the war, thousands were lost to ground fire. The first prototype flew against the Sukhoi Design Bureau's Su-6 in a state-sponsored competition to determine the aircraft best suited to the ground attack role, but though the IL-2 was deemed to be the better aircraft, it was still too underpowered and it was way too heavy. In addition to the armor, much of this weight came from the rear gun and the cockpit extension. On the subsequent prototype, horsepower was increased from 1,350 to 1,700 when the McCoolin AM35 engine was swapped for the more powerful AM38 liquid-cooled V12. It was also determined that the rear gun and gunner weren't necessary, and the next variant was a lighter, more agile single-seater, though battlefield conditions mandated that they be reincorporated later when losses to German fighters became unacceptably high. The final prototype that would become the first service model was ordered into production in March of 19. 41, at which time it was redesignated the IL-2. Thirty-eight feet, that's eleven point six five meters long and approximately forty-five feet, that's a fourteen point six five meters from wingtip to wingtip. IL twos had a maximum takeoff weight of slightly more than fourteen thousand pounds or six thousand three hundred and sixty kilograms, though they rarely flew quite that heavy. With a fuel capacity of approximately 190 gallons, the engine could propel the aircraft to a top speed of just 250 miles per hour, that's 410 kilometers an hour, which was at least 100 miles per hour, 161 kilometers an hour, slower than most of the aircraft that were its most persistent adversaries. That said, it was never meant to tangle with dedicated fighters, and its range of 475 miles, 765 kilometers, and endurance time of nearly three hours meant it could loiter over the battlefield until its ammo and weapons had been depleted. IL-2 M3 armament included two 23mm VYA-23 cannons with 150 rounds each, two 7.62mm 30 caliber SHKAS machine guns with 750 rounds each, and one rear-facing, manually aimed 12.7mm 50 caliber machine gun with 300 rounds. Rockets were also frequently carried under wing hardpoints, but accuracy was notoriously poor, and with just two pounds, 0.9 kilogram warheads, they were largely ineffective, except in cases of direct hits on on the tops of tanks where the armor was thinnest. Later, IL 2s also carried cluster bomb canisters containing dozens of shape charge bomblets, which spread shrapnel over a wide area, making them particularly effective against troops and thinly armed vehicles like trucks and half tracks. IL 2s went into production at four factories, but by the time of the German invasion, less than 250 had been built, and the vital new aircraft were rolling off the assembly lines much more slowly than initial projections had estimated. Russian manufacturing wasn't as efficient as German, and with hundreds of individual suppliers spread over a large geographical area, getting parts where they were needed was just a constant challenge. In addition, early production was slow due to intermittent bombing of aircraft factories in and around Moscow. In fact, it became so debilitating that it was necessary to move many factories east of the Ural Mountains, after which production increased, but never to the level that Stalin had been expecting. To address the issue, he issued telegrams to managers at the factories with the lowest production numbers, informing them in no uncertain terms that they were letting down not only the Red Army, but the country as a whole. That's not going to end well for them. <laughs> The pointed messages stated that the managers had some nerve for not meeting production goals, that they were making a mockery of their positions, and that IL-2s were as vital to the war effort as bread and air. The last telegram ended with, this is my final warning. It goes without saying that falling out of Stalin's favor was bad for one's health, hence, like a switch had been flipped, Sturmovic production increased fourfold. <laughs> it's nothing quite like a gulag to get those motivational juices flowing terrifyingly.
IL-2's first saw combat with the 4th Ground Attack Regiment just days after the invasion commenced. But though the aircraft themselves were up to the task for which they'd been built, many pilots had had just a few hours of actual flight time, much of which was practicing takeoffs and landings. Few had even fired the cannon's stationary targets, let alone at a moving tank with shells whizzing around the canopy. Ground crews were unfamiliar with the new planes too, which meant that simple tasks like repairing, servicing, and rearming them between sorties took much longer than it should have. Not surprisingly, their effectiveness wasn't what it might have been, and initial losses were rather high. In the first few days, dozens of cervix were shot down by German fighters and ground fire, while scores more were lost to non-combat-related accidents and crashes. All told, more than 20 pilots were killed in less than a week, and the men and women who replaced them were often less experienced. In the early going, IL-2 pilots generally attacked armored columns flying straight and low, often just 200 feet 61 meters over the ground, which gave gunners relatively predictable targets. With losses and damage mounting, a new staggered assault tactic was devised, whereby groups of between 5 and 12 aircraft made their approaches in sweeping descending turns similar to those used by Ju-87 Stuka pilots, and when possible, missions were flown in low-light conditions at dawn and dusk, which helped conceal the planes against the dark sky. Another issue was that pilots initially relied too heavily on their RS-82 and RS-132 rockets. Despite small warheads, they were capable of taking out tanks, but due to wildly unpredictable flight paths, direct hits were exceedingly rare. Instead, cannons became the primary weapons. In the summer of 1943, IL-2s played a major role in the Battle of Kursk, the largest armored engagement in history, in which more than 6,000 tanks, 4,000 aircraft, and 2 million troops clashed. Tactics were further honed to include attacks of even more aircraft in precise coordination with tanks, artillery, and infantry. To prevent increasing losses from enemy fighters, the circle of death tactic was initiated, in which eight Sturmovics flew in a tight circle over the target area. In succession, each would peel off and dive down to attack, while the others covered it with their rear gunners, after which it would rejoin the circle and another would take its turn. In one instance, pilots claimed to have destroyed more than 70 German tanks in less than 20 minutes. General Razanov, the mastermind behind the circle of death, was later made a gold star hero of the Soviet Union. However, perhaps the most extraordinary claim made by Air Force pilots was that in just four hours, 240 tanks from the 17th Panzer Division were either destroyed or damaged, though these claims are largely unsubstantiated and what actually constituted damage has always been debatable. Ironically, subsequent historical investigations have determined that of the German armor destroyed at Kursk, relatively little was caused by IL-2s or any other Soviet aircraft, and few first-hand panzer crew accounts described anything more than the occasional loss due to air attack. In fact, most estimates of total German armor losses at Kursk put the real number at less than 400, and it's believed that the vast majority were taken out by tanks, anti-tank guns, and mines. Many were also abandoned after mechanical breakdowns, or simply because they'd thrown a track or run out of gas. Though the claims may have been inflated, there's little doubt that Sturmoviks were menaces, and ground forces considered them godsends if not for their effectiveness, for their ability to raise Soviet morale while having debilitating psychological effects on Wehrmacht troops. Heavy losses to enemy fighters made reincorporating a rear gunner imperative by early 1942. The Rai two-seater now featured a gunner's portal, and early single-seat variants were modified by cutting a hole in the back of the canopy to accommodate the machine gun. The occupant sat on a small canvas sling similar to a hammock, and the new variant featured a slightly elongated fuselage with a partially open canopy that provided some protection against the elements, though in winter conditions were brutally cold. Mounted in a small ball and socket turret, the gun could be elevated up to 35 degrees and traversed 35 degrees to starboard, while only 15 degrees to port. Since the tail was directly in the line of fire and the gun couldn't be angled downward except to the sides, German pilots learned to attack from below along the aircraft's center line, which largely shielded them from defensive fire. Excluding the weight of the gunner, the upgrade increased the plane's weight by just 370 pounds, that's 167 kilograms, and manufacturer tests determined the setup to be effective, if not altogether comfortable. 
Maximum speed decreased only moderately, though the plane's handling characteristics were altered because the center of gravity had been shifted rearward. These later two-seat variants also included aerodynamic improvements, increased fuel capacity, and the replacement of metal outer wing panels with wood ones for more weight reduction. In addition, gunners weren't protected by the thickest parts of the armor, as the pilots were. In some areas, the rear armor was 75% thinner than it was up front, hence gunner casualties were substantially higher, and it was common for pilots to land damaged aircraft with a dead gunner behind them. This was exacerbated by the fact that Soviet policy forbade Stamovics from disengaging before they'd expended all of their ammunition and ordnance, which often required repeated, predictable passes over targets that gave ground troops multiple chances to direct fire accurately. Soviet commanders on the ground also frequently requested, as in ordered, additional passes over the targets, even when the planes were out of ammunition, only to harass and distract the Germans. IL-2s were never meant to be fighters, but as they say, desperate times, desperate measures. Between 1941 and early 1943, cervix were occasionally used to engage and intercept enemy fighters and bombers, respectively. Though hopelessly outclassed by Messerschmitt Bf-109s and Fokker Wolf Fw-190s, when attacking unescorted bombers, transports, and twin-engine destroyers like Bf-110s, they were lethally effective, though the 110s could easily outrun them if they detected their pursuers early enough. When IL-2 pilots found themselves in the unenviable position of having a German fighter on their tail, they typically reduced power drastically as the enemy closed in. In many cases, this dramatic change in airspeed caused the attacker to overshoot its prey and, with a little luck, fly right into the IL-2's cannon sight. During the middle and late stages of the war, the Soviet Union relied more heavily on women pilots. Lieutenant Anna Yegorova flew nearly 250 missions in an IL-2 and was decorated for heroics three times. In late 1944, she was posthumously awarded the Gold Star of Hero after being presumed dead after failing to return to base. However, the posthumous classification was premature because she survived and was actually imprisoned in a German POW camp. But perhaps the most interesting story is of a young pilot who survived a crash after being shot down in 1942. Fleeing from the plane and hiding in a wooded area nearby, he watched in astonishment as a German Bf 109 landed nearby, after which the pilot strolled over to inspect the plane that had just downed. But akin to leaving Yorkies in the ignition while running into the convenience store for a packet of smokes, he left the plane's engine running, and the enterprising young Russian ran up to the fighter, hopped in, and hammered the throttle and took off. On the flight home, he barely avoided being shot down by Soviet fighters, apparently by waving his arms wildly and rocking the plane from side to side in the hopes that his comrades would recognize him. But from a statistical standpoint, if the numbers are to be believed, the most lethal of all IL-2 pilots was a young pilot by the name of Nelson Stepanian. On what would be his final mission in mid-December of 1944, his plane was fatally damaged by anti-aircraft fire, but he managed to limp it out to sea and fly it into a German warship, which subsequently sank. All told, official Soviet records claim that Stepan flew nearly 250 combat sorties, single-handedly sunk more than a dozen ships, destroyed 80 tanks and more than 500 armored vehicles, and even shot down at least 25 aircraft. Arguably more than any other aircraft, and perhaps the infamous Russian winter itself, IL-2s were most responsible for repelling the Nazi juggernaut. They also suffered some of the heaviest losses, totaling nearly 11,000 aircraft. Since relatively few airplanes were in service in 1941, losses totaled just more than 500, but in both 1943 and 1944, the numbers exceeded 3,300. Most remaining aircraft were retired after the war, but some soldiered on into the early 1950s with the air forces of Czechoslovakia, Poland, and Yugoslavia. So I really hope you found today's video interesting. If you did, please do hit that like button below. Don't forget to subscribe. If you've got a suggestion for a future mega project, leave it in the comments below. And thank you for watching.